So, for reasons that pretty much boil down to my eccentric uncle's persistence, I am here today in scenic Juatuba, Brazil. Now, unfortunately, I speak some Spanish and little German, very little Portuguese. While the French drop whole syllables from their words, and the Irish letters never, ever make the sounds you think they will, Portuguese is the first language at which I have looked that adds letters where there are no letters. Just for example, in my handy-dandy flashcards, the word for bread looks like pau, but it is said paum. Very inconsiderate Portugal. Colonialism is very silly, and if I get the opportunity to retroactively veto it, I shall. Now, one of the things a clever person might have brought is a tripod. As the evidence would suggest, I am not a clever person. Love me anyway, please. But something I left behind because I thought I was being a clever person was my books, because I sort of assumed there would be internet aplenty somewhere, and I could do with ebooks or audiobooks. I had a list, y'all. Unfortunately, the internet is about as good as my Portuguese. So if you find yourself in a reading slump, I can honestly say that if you go with only four books to a location where there is very little internet, and stay there for 40 days and 40 nights and some change, a steady diet of books will be all that you want. My uncle tells me that the way to learn Portuguese is to make friends with a child who discerns that you're not talking quite right for your age and wants to help. Next door to us is a darling young family, one of whom is Letitia, an excessively cute young lady and fellow YouTuber. Letitia was kind enough to lend me an art book for ages five years old and up. So in Portuguese, the book is explaining to me the history of things like the metal plate photographs and the artistic significance of things like Superman and Dragon Ball Z. So I now have five books to read in Brazil. And I'm taking my reading of it seriously enough that I've started having homework dreams wherein I haven't done the essay and I'm trying to BS something on the spot. The publisher did not go to Brazil, but she did go to Peru. And she said that if possible, I really ought to try to see the pink dolphins of the Amazon. And while that is not not on my list of things to do, my principal goals in coming to Brazil were A, to try piranha for the first time, and B, to learn enough Portuguese that I can interpret and tell jokes. I think one of those goals is more realistic than the other one. Right, so, I have never had so much beer. In the United States, they occasionally have Brazilian steakhouses that are frightfully expensive, but the way those work is they will come around with kebabs, and they will slice you off a hunk of meat of whatever they happen to be carrying. And so you end up getting a little bit of everything that builds up to a whole lot of meat at one sitting over time. I just came back from a Brazilian huasco. Huasco? I believe that's the word for barbecue. And it is very good barbecue, but it is very similar. It's a family style affair where they cut up the meat and you get a little bit of lots of stuff over a, the course of a meal. And the imperative phrase to learn is, no quiero mais brigado. I don't want more, thank you or they will be relentless in giving you food. Similarly with beer, if the lady of the house does not want to drink an entire beer, she will split it between the two of y'all, but then she'll do that four times and end up ingesting a total of two beers and think she had not yet had one. So the imperative phrase is, no quiero mais obrigado. I don't want more, thank you. Right, so it is something like day six in Brazil? day two of shooting without a tripod. In case you're curious, the books that made it down to Brazil with me are The Borrowers, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, The Salamillion, and Hatful of Sky, and will almost certainly be read in that order. Although, when absorbing the internet signal that kind of wafts among the neighbors, I did have the unorthodox privilege of absorbing The Hunting of the Snark by Lewis Carroll. And people who are smarter about literature than I might be able to tell you better, but I get the impression that Lewis Carroll was kind of an abstract artist of the written word. When asked if it was perhaps about the search of happiness, he said, yeah, probably. But either it is a particularly sad take on the search for happiness, or due to the Rorschachian nature of fiction. What I get from it is happiness is a fleeting thing. The people who are trying to help you find it are working against you either accidentally or on purpose. And that thing which you most fear is indeed the thing that will probably kill you. As far as the goals I originally set for coming to Brazil, I have not yet tried piranha. I have not bitten them, but they have not bitten me, so that is a win. And while I do not know enough Portuguese to tell and interpret jokes, I have been brought into keen remembrance that sight gags still work. For example, a neighbor lady recently spoke of chuva, or rain, and mentioned that the car was dirty and that if they parked it out in the rain they might be able to get it clean. To which I more or less said, And that kind of got a laugh. Might have been a pity laugh. Beggars can't be choosers. 
So I had a bit of a tantrum while reading my friend's book. They seem to be getting into special effects through the ages, and I've actually seen some old friends like Charlie Chaplin and Fritz Lang. But when I got to Godzilla and saw that Tokyo was spelled T-O-Q-U-I-O, I got annoyed something fierce and decided it was all made up. Except part of the reason why I am in Brazil and do not understand the lingo is because England and Portugal both did a colonialism, and the junk that those folks used to describe foreign lands is in fact all made up. So it's day eight in Brazil, which means it's a little less than 40 days to go. I am something like a third of the way through 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and attempting to conserve my chapters to something like three chapters a day. As far as the learning of Portuguese goes, I don't believe I am an effective joke teller, but I have seen jokes within harpooning distance off my larboard bow. And the light beer with which the nice folks who live here have been kind enough to fill me indeed seems to hydrate better than the water. Skeptics, feel free to do your own experimentation. Take your time. I'll wait. So in the yard of my uncle, we have bananas and we have mangoes. We have no avocados. The avocados we have to get from a neighbor. And when I saw the avocados, they looked strange to me. When I told my uncle this, he said that it was his understanding that in the United States, the avocados are incredibly heavily curated to look like something that Americans will understand, kind of like carrots or bananas. Also in Brazil, it is normal to have sugar with your avocado. And while attempting to take photographs of these avocados with the intent of showing you nice folks, my uncle and I had a friendly dispute about what is and is not a good photograph. See, for a couple days he's been photobombing all of the pictures that would ordinarily have been for Instagram because it is his opinion that photos really ought to have people in them. And while I don't 100% agree with that, because I believe there's room for things like scenery and still lifes and things that show off one's technical skill as a photographer that don't necessarily include people, I became aware that the principal aim of taking pictures for Instagram is to more or less get everyone in the mentality of taking pictures as though one were shooting a commercial. And commercial videography, the idea is to leave as many people out of it as possible to entice the viewer toward fantasy fulfillment. Less, wish you were here, and more, don't you wish you were here. Which has caused me to reevaluate why I am taking photographs. Am I taking them because I am on a trip of a lifetime, and want to remember that trip? Or am I taking them to show off? And I have a suspicion that future tense me will be more glad that I took this photograph, not this one. I am not going to be a lightweight when I get back to the States. The uncle is friends with not one, but two moonshiners. The Brazilian hooch is commonly called cachaça, or pinga, which is a little bit like drippy drop, like when rain falls from the sky, kind of like it is now. People will occasionally look up and say, pinga, pinga. And I learned something remarkable. The Portuguese word for vanilla is baunilla, which might do me some good in Portugal. But the Brazilians don't know what it means, and I've thus far been hard-pressed to find it at the supermarkets. So the customary means by which I would be making the pinga taste a little less terrible is not within my grasp right now. But that's okay. People seem pretty keen to fill me up with beer. A first world problem if ever I heard of one. So I've been to a few major and minor cities since I've been to Brazil. Buchim, Juatuba, Cantajum, Belo Horizonte. And I believe in all of the cities I've been to, there have been pictures of that guy. Somebody painted on the wall, sometimes in decal, all of which seem to tell the onlooker without words, there is cold beer sold here. I don't know if Matt Groening is aware that his character has become so iconic that it is a symbol for the jelly drunk abroad. But that has got to be something of an achievement. Right, so it's been something like three weeks in Brazil, and it's another three weeks and some change to go. It's a long time to spend among people whose language you do not know. And in social situations, I seem to go in stages of intelligence circuit meltdown. The first is when my brain is no longer absorbing or translating Portuguese. And the second stage is my brain no longer absorbing or translating English. Between that and the abrupt weather shifts, which tend to aggravate my old person pain, I am becoming better acquainted with naps than ever I have been. As far as reading and writing are concerned, I finished 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, about which I will chat with you in detail later, but for now, I am rationing out my remaining two books, because unless something changes, they are my only reading material for the next few weeks. Also, one of the folks down here has been kind enough to furnish me with a guitar, a charitable loan for which she expects me to sing in church. Which is fine, except in looking back, I remember the first verse to a whole lot of songs, of which the second, third, and fourth verses get muddled in my memory. And in all modesty, the writers of some of those old hymns are less careful with their words than I would have been. 
For instance, in Protestant circles, there's this song that circles round and round called Holy, 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 in reference to what the seraphim supposedly sing in heaven. Overall, the song is a success. Except round about the second verse, there's this really, really stupid phrase, and my brain just keeps choking on it. And that phrase is, which wort and art and evermore shall be. I am no expert on Middle English, but in my youth I read the King James Bible possibly more than any other book. And long enough ago that I cannot cite my sources, I was told by a smart someone that by the time Shakespeare was doing his thing with his plays, and Wycliffe was doing his thing with the Bible, you and thou were being used interchangeably, as well as here with hither, and art with are. So anybody using thou and art instead of you and are, were probably doing it either for the sake of sounding more poetic or more formal. And if memory serves, the King James Bible does use you and thou fairly regularly. Cool. What the Sam Hill is wort? Come on, guys, we have all seen Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. Does Linus say, and there weren't shepherds abiding in the field? And they weren't so afraid? So I've stopped practicing, holy, holy, holy. And if I end up singing it in church, I'm going to apply some heavy duty wort remover. I think that's not who it was. Right, so, 19 days to go in Brazil, and I'm down to my last paper and ink book. This would make me slightly more nervous if I hadn't also been writing. During my downtime in the evenings, I've worked out some, watched some movies, which were a nice surprise on my remembering that I am a video editor and didn't necessarily have to go cold turkey off tech if I did not want to. The lack of internet has been a challenge, but not as big a one as you'd think. I think the feeling the internet helps connect us to the world is a little misleading in that a lot of the stuff we see day to day is just the same nonsense over and over again with a different spin. But for I See London, I have written two smut stories, which I eventually intended to send it to the publisher in the form of unsolicited submissions. I'm sure she'll be thrilled. Also, I've got my second sunburn in January, a thing which I was warned about, but I'd never actually experienced. And that was the fact that even if you think you are in the shade, if you are next to a swimming pool, that reflection off the water can burn you really good. Once again, experience proves to be the best teacher, but also a teacher with a mean streak a mile wide. It's Brazil in the rainy season, and I am on the side of the house where the internet lives. Scant, thimble full of internet. And I was trying to download a large text message, and I got stuck. The awning is not quite big enough to keep the rain off. I can absolutely make do with no internet, but it's not my favorite. I'm not making as much do as God. God is making an awful lot of do, and that is precipitating the problem, as it were. Rain drops be falling on my head. Oh, in my eye. Also, I heard once that scorpions are a water sign. I did not believe it because I'd always associated scorpions with the desert, but apparently there are scorpions in Brazil. Good times. So I have something like 10 full days left in Brazil, and half a Terry Pratchett book, which I am reading through slow, and rereading some of the other books to make it last. As far as getting more proficient with Brazilian jokes, I've learned a couple things about Portuguese puns. The word for mosquito down here is penilongo, or long leg. And the penny part, slash the leg part, is apparently close enough to the word penis that it will pardon the expression come up if one's host gets tipsy and his or her inhibitions low enough. Also, the most readily available dark beer down here is Kara Ku, but Kara is interchangeable with head and Ku is interchangeable with butt. So if one is deaf and dumb, but one can point to one's head and one's butt, one can order a dark beer in Brazil. Also, I got to have a little bit of fun with our hostess who by and large acts indisputably like a saint most of the time. But a couple nights back here, I caught her reaching for the cachaça slash pinga slash sugarcane hooch that a lot of the folks drink around here. And she went. But the sugarcane hooch, like vodka, is the color of water. So I got to have a little bit of fun with her and go, oh, agua. She's still speaking to me. I think all is well. The cityscape at which you are currently looking is that of Bella Rizanche, or Good Horizon. It is the nearest large town to where I have been staying, and I'm told is home to a lot of cool stuff, such as the Parque Municipal, the Brazilian equivalent of Central Park, and the Mercado Central, of which my most vivid memories are 
the toilets one has to pay to use. Right or wrong, the thing that has fascinated me this particular day is the Brazilian attitude toward graffiti, which seems to be less a symptom that your part of town is run down than it is a sign that you had a vertical flat surface, hitherto undecorated, and someone was kind enough to fix it for you. It is not a matter of if your exterior wall is going to be decorated, it is a matter of by whom, and whether or not the art is an advertisement or an independent artist choosing to flex some creative muscles on your storefront. Right, so it is six days left in Brazil, five chapters left on Hatful of Sky. I'm getting to see more of Mistress Weatherwax, aka Life Goals, which is a nice surprise. And if the world were less broken, I would want to be a character called Pachulia when I grow up. I don't know if I will get Piranha tried. Confidentially, I think the Piranha will get executed without a trial. So we are down to the last two full days of Brazil, and it is unlikely that I will get to try Piranha. Although when I keep telling the locals that I would like to try it, they keep on going, why? So perhaps I'm not missing much. I have gotten a larger command of Portuguese than when I started, and while I am not proficient at telling and interpreting jokes, between learning about bunda, which is but, cu, which is but, and cigarro, which is cigarette, which is a kind of but, as soon as I find the jokes to go with them, I'll be all set. My uncle's dear ones have told him that he is his best self in Brazil, and I believe him. I'm actually really glad that I got to meet that guy. And even if our trips do not go according to plan, I am told by experts that our time will not be wasted. There are days where I think that I am a good writer, and then I read Terry Pratchett, and end up with this kind of euphoric despair because I will never be that good. But while we are on the subject of travel, if I did not defer to the old master, I'd be doing something stupid. Why do you go away? So that you can come back so that you can see the place you came from with new eyes and extra colors. And the people there see you differently, too. Coming back to where you started is not the same as never leaving. Thank you for taking this long, strange trip with me. Until we meet again, take it easy. Love you.